So Joab, son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. So in the opening sentence of this chapter, we are introduced to three characters. Many of you will be able to describe all three of these with great clarity, but just so that we're on the same page, let me give you just a brief outline of each. So Joab will have a key part to play in this chapter and beyond. Joab is David's right-hand man. David is the king. Joab is the commander of Israel's armies, and they work very closely together. They're also very good friends. You might remember, though, um, back at the beginning of 2 Samuel, when we started this series many months ago, um, after King Saul died, his son tried to claim the throne, and he gathered 10 tribes in the north in alliance with him. And only the southern tribes remained loyal to David, the rightful king, the God-anointed king. So there was something of a civil war in those opening chapters. Ish-bosheth, king of the north, David, king of the south, and they each had a commander. Abner up north, Joab down south. And we read about Abner having a fallout with his king. He came down south and tried to come under David's leadership. Um, David, it seems, was quite happy to believe that that change of heart was genuine, but Joab did not much like the sound of sharing the stage with Abner. And so he took him aside as if to have a private word with him, chapter 3, verse 27, and there to avenge the blood of his brother Asahel, who died in battle, Joab stabbed him in the stomach and he died. David was furious about this. Joab was acting there without orders and against the king's desires. But it reveals something about Joab's character that is worth keeping our eye on for these next few chapters. Joab has got a real ruthless streak in him. And there are a few moments in the narrative that will kind of shock you, I think, when Joab will do something without any care in the world about what his king will think. He does it, it seems, without any thought or any concern for the consequences. He just acts brutally and violently in his own interest. So this Joab has got a vicious streak in him. Still, he loves David. He is David's closest confidant. He is the commander. David is the king. That's Joab. Also, of course, that introduces the second of our three characters. Joab, son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. Who's the king? Well, obviously, it's King David, of course. It is his life that we've been studying for the last few months. The series is called A Better King. And ultimately, we've been seeing not just David, but through David, images of Jesus. And so what David does well, Jesus does better. And where David fails, David, uh, Jesus rather, fulfills all righteousness. Where David uh, fails and stumbles, Jesus stands firm. It is fascinating to compare David with Jesus, his great descendant. And so um, it won't, won't surprise you to know that as with most weeks, we're going to close this evening by thinking about how King Jesus would respond in similar circumstances to the ones that we see in this particular chapter. And so his heart then longed for Absalom. Um, last week we saw a pretty horrendous scene. I'm amazed that you've turned up again <laughs> to find out uh, what happens after that because it's been grim, hasn't it, for the last few weeks. Now, this man, Absalom, um, son of David, prince in Israel, invited his brothers to attend a feast. The father, David, didn't attend. And so Absalom seized this opportunity to enact revenge on one particular brother, someone that he hated, and not without reason, actually. It was his brother, Amnon. And so after that um, dramatic assassination of one of the sons, the remaining sons of David all fled home to him in Jerusalem. And together they grieved, presumably not just the loss of their brother, but no doubt they grieved just the miserable circumstances that have engulfed them all in recent years. The things this family has been through is unbelievable. Um, Absalom, the murderer, did not return home. He ran for refuge elsewhere. He is in hiding as our chapter begins. And so given the events of recent months and years, actually, in David's life, can't you imagine that he would be probably just like a shadow of his former self? Imagine a meal at the palace. David is a king. His kingdom is prosperous. In theory, there is nothing he can't accomplish. But the finest food at this feast won't restore his broken family. He looks around the table and sees Tamar, a desolate woman. That's how the Bible describes her. That woman whose inner life is like a war zone. That she has been ruined by the rape she has had to endure by that evil brother, Amnon. Amnon himself, 
of course, is no more, slain by his own brother Absalom. Absalom is in hiding, fearing ever to come home, and David has never sent any signal that he is welcome. So he believes he is in exile, banished by his father, and of course, the punishment for murder is death. So of course, he's not coming home. How David must have wept about the state of his own family, how it must have grieved him to see it happen. Now, Joab sees the sorrow in his friend's heart and he recognizes the following things. What's done is done. There is no bringing Amnon back from the grave. There is no reversing the circumstances of the last few years. But there doesn't have to be two empty seats at that table. It is possible for Absalom to be brought back home. Now, as you might imagine, David is conflicted about that idea. And that becomes very clear in this passage. He's not seen this son since that fateful day. How would you do looking into the eyes of one son, knowing that he has killed another of your sons? More complex still, this son, Absalom, he only acted because you, David, did not act. The Bible says he was angry but did nothing. Well, that's not good enough. And into that vacuum of action, Absalom stepped foot. I imagine that seeing this boy again would bring up all sorts of feelings of guilt and sorrow and regret, and also deep love and longing for restoration, a desire for a relationship that cannot go back to the way that it once was. So much has changed between father and son now that they would need to forge a new kind of relationship for the future. Now, I imagine just a storm of sorrow in David's heart. He doesn't know what to do for the best. And it's at that point that his dear friend Joab steps forward. He's got a plan. Um, Joab effectively goes to the local actors guild and he hires a woman for a strange private event. (laughs) Joab is going to be the director of this pantomime and he says to her in verse two, pretend you are in mourning, dress in mourning clothes, do not use any cosmetic lotions, act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead, then go to the king and speak these words to him. It's a fascinating little scene, isn't it? He is literally wheeling in the costume department. (laughs) Wear these kinds of clothes. Stay away from that kind of makeup. Oh, and I've printed your script and highlighted your lines. Make sure that you learn them word for word. Go to the king and speak these words to him. (laughs) What a strange situation this woman finds herself in, right? (laughs) Still, she plays her part fantastically well uh, to her credit as a young actress. Now, the aim of the plan is to effectively draw out of David some genuine sympathy for this made up situation and then point out that that same sympathy ought to apply to his own situation. And therefore, the the sensible, impartial thing is to invite Absalom to come home in the knowledge that the king does not hold it against him. There is no threat hanging over him. He will not be prosecuted as the man who murdered the crown prince of Israel, which, of course, is what Abner was. His dad just wants him home. Now, the question is, why this elaborate scheme? (laughs) Why this actress hired in to spin a story when Joab could just say to David, look, David, why don't you bring your boy home? No one would hold it against you. We can see that your heart is hurting, that you are longing for restoration. Let us go and send a messenger to go and bring your boy back. Why doesn't Joab just say that? Well, two reasons that I can think of. You could think of many more, I expect. First, I think Joab has probably tried it. (laughs) Closest person in the world to him, commander and king, thick as thieves. Don't you think they've probably discussed these sort of things before? Yeah, probably. Probably Joab has tried it and been unsuccessful in conversation. Secondly, because it was not all that long ago that the same tactic worked on David. Do you remember? Um, When Nathan the prophet uh, came and approached David about his sin, he told him a story. And David as a man with some wisdom, was able to see the particulars of that story accurately, and he responded to it appropriately. And at that point, Nathan held up the mirror and said, the story is about you, David. You are the man. This is often the case. Maybe you've noticed this yourself. We're often quite good at discerning the problem and understanding the solution in everybody's life apart from our own. (laughs) find it very easy to step into someone else's problems and apply our wisdom to them But we've got all sorts of blind spots and and inner conflicts and sin-saturated corners of our hearts that prevent us from seeing our own lives with that same sort of clarity. Which, by the way, is why we have one another, one of the reasons at least, so that we can look out for each other and help one another. 
The Bible has, I think, 58 one another commands in the New Testament. Why? Well, because by definition, we actually need each other. (laughs) We cannot live well alone. Anyway, all this to say, uh, Joab is pretty confident that David will be able to see the wisdom in what he is recommending if he kind of presents this as a story that has nothing to do with David, as though we're we're all happening to someone else. And then at the end, he's going to reveal, David, this is about you. (laughs) So apply that same logic to these circumstances and it will all be well. So the woman from Tekoa went to the king and she fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor and said to him, help me, your majesty. I like to imagine that she's you know, really giving it some welly. Remember, she's an actress. This is not real for her. Um, she's a bit of an Amdram star locally. And so she'll likely never get a gig like this again. Um, commissioned in to perform this play for the king. Help me, your majesty. And the king asked her, what is troubling you? She said, this is the big story then. She's learned her lines well. I am a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons. They got into a fight with each other in the field and no one was there to separate them. One struck and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant. They say, hand over the one who struck his brother down so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well. They would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant on the face of the earth. It's a pretty tragic tale, isn't it? Um, There are some obvious similarities between this story and the one that has just taken place over the last chapter or so in the Bible. Um, One brother has risen up against the other. One brother has killed the other. Uh, One brother is off in hiding. And the the fear, the danger in his return is that there will be cries for his blood. That this is the man who killed the crown prince in Israel. So there are similarities in these stories. There are also wild differences between the two as well. And you probably noticed this as well. Um, Her story depicts a two-way fight on a level playing field. (laughs) Absalom set up a trap and sprung it with precision. He killed his brother while distracting him with drink. Do you remember? He was unable to fight back. One was an accident, an escalation of a fight. The other was absolutely intentional. One was in the passion of the moment. The other was in cold-blooded cunning. It had been planned and prepared for months. There are massive differences between these two scenarios. But that is as good of a job as Joab can do in spinning a story that will work. He's no Nathan, is he? (laughs) He's no Nathan the prophet. Still, the story does the job by stirring up David's sympathy. She is a widow. She is poor. She is desperate. Her heart is broken. She has nothing left. David sees her plight. David sees her hopelessness. And he really wants to help. Verse 8, the king said to the woman, go home and I will issue an order on your behalf. In other words, let me think about it. (laughs) Give me some time. I will reach a conclusion. It will be fair, and I will issue my command. I'll do what I can for you. But the woman isn't settling for that. I don't know if Joab had coached her on what to do if David tried to delay, or if this is like improv acting at its finest. But she hits the nail on the head here. She pushes him for a decision there and then. The woman from Tekoa said to him, Let my lord the king pardon me and my family, and let the king and his throne be without guilt. She's effectively saying to him, look, David, if you're afraid of what people will say, that perhaps you've been unfair and unjust by pardoning my son, I want you to know, David, I'll stick up for you. (laughs) I'll say that I pleaded with you. No one will think bad of you, David, if you do this. Um, I think this is kind of just needling his pride a little bit. David, if you're worried about what's going to happen to your reputation, I will say that the king and the throne are without guilt. I will stand between you and the mean comments that you might get. The king replied, if anyone says anything to you, bring them to me and they will not bother you again. He can't stand the thought of this um, poor, sweet, little old woman, this weak, widowed lady having to be his defender in this situation, standing between him and the comments and criticism that he might get if he judges this case leniently here. And so David, in his typical heroic way, switches their roles around, doesn't he? He says, no, no, if someone comes to you to say anything mean, I'll stand between them and you. You bring them to me, I'll deal with them. 
<laughs> she's done a marvelous job, hasn't she? Like kind of raising his sympathies. Like give this actress a pay rise, I say. Excellent work from her. And here she is then pushing for a decision in verse 11. Then let the king invoke the Lord his God to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction so that my son shall not be destroyed. Okay, so you say that you don't care about what people will say, that you do see my plight, that you will rule in favor of my son. So David, I'm pleading with you, rule in favor of forgiveness. This is the big crescendo moment. As surely as the Lord lives, David said, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. David might have expected his court to ring out in praise at this declaration. It's got kind of shadows of the wisdom of Solomon here found in the father. So compassionate, so gracious, so wise and understanding of the situation. The woman clears her throat and shuffles her feet a little awkwardly. She's got more to say. (laughs) What on earth is going on here? Let your servant speak a word, she says. Okay, I thought that would have concluded things, but fine. The woman says, why have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, Does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son. This is the moment where the mirror is being held up to David. (laughs) I wonder if he's getting sick of this stunt being pulled on him by now. Like water spilled on the ground which cannot be recovered, so we must die. There's some debate about what exactly this means. I think at the very least it probably means this. There are some things that are irreversible. Some things that you cannot change, you can't take back. Amnon is dead, you can't change that. You can't scoop the water back into the cup and use it all over again. No, it's spilled, it has seeped into the ground, it's gone. Some things you can't change, but there are other things that you can change while you still have life. Before the cup is spilled, before the curtain falls, while the story goes on, you have a say in how it gets written. So choose forgiveness here. Choose reconciliation. Write that ending to this story. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. So David, do your bit, she says. Extend your hand. Offer peace. Call your son home so that he does not remain banished forever. After all, isn't this how God has treated you, she says. God devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished forever from him. Now we'll come back to that statement because um, that is the most insightful thing she says. And it's also not quite as simple as it sounds. Now, on the surface, it sounds like everybody here is just recommending that we sweep sins under the rug and pretend they never happened. That is not at all whatever happens to sin, is it? They don't stay under that rug. <laughs> as I say, we'll come back to it. He devises ways. What ways does God devise so that banished people do not have to remain banished from him? Now, if you're following along, in verse 15, things get a little bit weird. She jumps back into drama mode here. And now I've come to say this to my lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I will speak to the king. Perhaps he will grant his servant's request. Perhaps the king will agree to deliver his son from the hand of the man uh, who cut off both me and my son from God's inheritance. It's a bit weird that she goes back into acting mode here after having confronted him and achieved the purpose for which she came. Um, Perhaps she's worried about how David will respond to this kind of confrontation. I mean, she's not a prophet, is she? She's an actress. She's not used to doing this sort of thing, confronting the king of the land. So she's now kind of retreating into the story that she arrived with. But it's certainly somewhat strange. (laughs) Now your servant says, may the word of my Lord, the king, secure my inheritance. For my Lord, the king is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. May the Lord, your God, be with you. I think she's really kind of laying it on thick here at the end, trying to sweeten him after she's so brutally confronted him just a moment ago. Again, the commentaries seem to struggle to to shed much light on why exactly she would revert to her story after that big moment of confrontation. But I think it's just nerves. I think she's just a human being, isn't she? Either way, this is a record of what happened, isn't it? So this is how it happened. David, it seems, has seen enough. He's certainly heard enough. He's twigged what is going on here. Then the king said to the woman, don't keep from me the answer to what I am going to ask you. Let my lord the king speak, the woman said. The king asked, isn't the hand of Joab with you in all this? <laughs> now, in the drama that plays out in my mind, the king is 
kind of smiling as he says this. Isn't the hand of Joab with you in all this? I think if he were uh, grumpy or angry, then it would reveal itself in the narrative in some way. He doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't rebuke Joab. He seems to find the whole pantomime somewhat amusing. And he gets the point of what she is saying and why she has come. To speed the narrative a little bit, she takes her bow, exit the, the stage, the curtain drops, the house lights come up, and Joab is called in for a quick conversation with the king. Verse 21, the king said to Joab, very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. Well, Joab is delighted. He falls on his face. He praises the king and he calls for the son now to return. And here's where things take a turn. The whole situation sours here. Joab went to Gesher and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king said he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. Now here's the question. Has David forgiven him or not? Does David want him back or not? Because he's been brought all the way back to Jerusalem, but the relationship has not been restored. He's not actually home, is he? It's kind of halfway between the two. Verse 28, Absalom lived for two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him. So he sent a second time, but he refused to come. I think Joab has probably pushed his luck as far as he dares, and he doesn't want to be seen to be doing the bidding of Absalom rather than the bidding of David. He knows the sensitivities of this situation. He knows that David is the one keeping Absalom at arm's length, and he doesn't particularly want to get caught in the middle of this family feud. And so having done all that he can to try and soothe the pain in David's heart because of his absent son, he's done his bit and he's doing no more. (laughs) But Absalom has called for him twice, knowing that Joab was the one who called him to return. He refuses to come until, at verse 30, Absalom said to his servants, look, Joab's field is next to mine and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab did go to Absalom's house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? That's certainly one way of getting his attention, isn't it? And it worked, didn't it? It certainly was effective. Absalom then makes the case that now he's in no man's land. He's neither lost nor found. He's neither accepted or rejected. He's just stuck in the middle. He says, it would be better for me if I was still over there in Gesher. Why has he brought me home? If I am guilty, let him kill me. If I am not, let him forgive me. That's the point. So Joab went to the king and told him this. So the king summoned Absalom and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king and the king kissed Absalom. Now the narrative is deliberately light on detail here. We don't see any weeping. We don't see any embrace. We see a customary kiss. This is standard. We don't even see any speech exchanged between the two of them. It's a really strange closing scene to this story. Here's what we wish we saw. Repentance from both of them, actually. Forgiveness for both of them. Real reconciliation between them. None of those things happen. And this, I think, is the most surprising, confronting lesson of this particular chapter. The kiss here is false because there is no forgiveness behind it. The reconciliation here is false because there is no repentance behind it. This is such a heartbreaking scene because it is a grotesque parody of gospel forgiveness. It is so important that we understand this. Without repentance, there is no reconciliation. Perhaps you've been in situations in your life where something terrible has happened between you and another person. And dealing with the issue will require more pain than you are willing to put up with. And so you opt for the alternative, which is to pretend everything is fine. That is what is happening here. The issues have not been addressed. David was half-hearted in his acceptance of his son, and his son knew it, didn't he? (laughs) Why am I here in Jerusalem but not there with my dad? Looks like he's bringing me near, but he's constantly keeping me away. There is no peace between them. There is a pantomime to round off this scene, which is the irony of the whole thing, because at the end here, David is the one playing a role, but his heart's not in it, and his son knows. 
Absalom, for his part, seems to have no regret, shows no sign of repentance, does not recognize the seriousness of taking these matters into his own hands the way that he did. And so while they both kind of go through this weird pantomime, they go through the motions, he bows, they kiss, they share this kind of strange moment together, but they both know the hostility hasn't been healed. This is what it looks like then when sin is swept under the rug, when it is not actually dealt with. Friend, this is what makes the forgiveness of God such a glorious, unique gift of true grace. With God, there is no halfway house. There is no partial forgiveness. That is such a blessing. There is no ambiguity. There's no guesswork with God. There is no, I wonder where I stand before him. Let me tell you exactly where you stand before him. If you are repentant, then Jesus has come to deal with your sin and reconcile God and man to die in your place for your sin, to take those sins upon his shoulders, to receive in his body the punishment that your sins deserve, to deal with those sins once and for all, permanently, for eternity, and through his death to cleanse you of your sin so that they will never be remembered and never held against you Ever, ever again, he keeps no record of wrongs. If you've asked him to save you, you are saved. If you've repented, you are reconciled. It is as clear as day. It is black and white. And the opposite is also true. If you refuse to repent, then you are not reconciled with God. There is no pretending with him. Your sin still separates you and him, and you remain in that separated state. Yes, his heart longs for you. He deeply loves you. He sends his messengers to you. Come home. You are welcome as soon as you're sorry. You will be my son. You will be an heir. All that I have will be yours. Come home with a repentant heart, and you will find true and free forgiveness from me. The clarity of the gospel is a gift, and we muddy the waters at our peril. The problem here was the lack of clarity. Nobody knew where they stood. No one was transparent or courageous enough to simply tell the truth about what was actually going on within them. The parable of the lost sons is similar and different. One son took the father's wealth and squandered it in wild living. He was in no doubt about his relationship with the father. It had been severed by his sin at his choice. And yet in that glorious parable that we looked at actually just on Tuesday night, what did the youngest son do? He came to his senses, right? He saw his sin for what it was. I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's how he described it. Suddenly aware of the squalor of his life, of the mess that he had made, he literally turned from his sin, turned towards his father. And when he was near enough to see, he found that his father's face was already turned towards him. And when he walked on home, he found that his father was running towards him. True repentance and true reconciliation is found in that story. That story also ended in a kiss, didn't it? But not a pantomime kiss, not pretend, but real and wholehearted. He threw his arms around his son, kissed him, put a ring on his finger, a robe on his back, sandals at his feet. He said, kill the fattened calf. Let us celebrate. My son has returned. He was dead, but now he is alive. This sad story in this chapter has a shadow of each of those elements, but none of the substance. There is no repentance, and therefore there is no reconciliation. Any apparent forgiveness here is a facade. It will crumble in no time at all. And we'll see that in the next chapter. So make God grant us an awareness of the seriousness of our sin so that we might truly repent. And the promise of God is that when we do, we will find his face turned towards us, full of love already. And before we even get home, he is running to receive us. He wants us back, not as slave, but as son, forgiven forever by the grace of our God. And he will remember our sins no more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that what you offer us is true and full and free forgiveness. We thank you too for the clarity of the gospel that we either have forgiveness from you or we don't. We have either repented or we have not. We've either returned home or we've kept ourselves at arm's length from you. But we are clear that you call us to come back 
with repentant hearts. Lord God, thank you for the extent of your grace that you would truly forgive us all our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we do ask that even in our relationships with others, you would make us quick to confess our sin and keen to forgive others and real when we reconcile. That our love for others might look a little bit like your great love for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.